Care and how Jeffrey House had helped him and that there was a war resistor campaign. So then I tried to contact them people, but even then you really don't know. You know, I mean, you, you're pretty, you have to really watch yourself. It was a really hard decision to make because we left our country and um, we didn't know what would happen when we got here. And we didn't know quite the support we would have coming here also. But in we were in hideout for 14 months prior to coming here. So it was halfway a big relief coming because then we didn't have to worry about the uh, law enforcement getting us in the United States. But it was a hard decision to leave our country and our family behind. The War Resisters Support Campaign gives assistance to American war resisters. It is a pan-Canadian coalition of community and labor organizations. The campaign helps find housing and other necessities. As well, it garners political support and does fundraising for the cause. I don't think I could have made it in another country without help. So if we hadn't contacted them and they said they would help us, I don't think we would have came with our, because we have four kids, it had been too big of a risk to come. Labor and faith groups have been instrumental in creating support for the war resisters. Labor federations and the Quakers, for example, have been at the forefront of the campaign. There's an amazing word of mouth among Quakers, and when we put a need out there, usually we can get it realized fairly quickly which is a real plus. And that's, of course, how it works now, is if the war resistors need assistance, they need help finding some accommodation, uh, they need clothing, or they need some further action um, with, the, with the government, we get the word out through our community, and they tend to respond fairly quickly, which is good. People who stand up for justice, and it does take a lot of courage and conviction to be able to say no to an illegal war, especially when you have to abandon your family, your country, your relatives and friends, but you stand up for a principle. So I think it is important that we welcome people like uh, Daryl and Brandon and the other war resistors uh, that have decided to come to Canada and it is our responsibility to make sure that they are given every opportunity to stay here and we need to lobby on their behalf that they are given an opportunity to stay here. The Canadian labour movement has a long history of anti-war activities including the nuclear disarmament movement of the 1950s, opposition to the Vietnam War in the 60s and 70s, and today, Labour has spoken out loudly against the war on Iraq. In this city and in most cities in Canada, the Labour movement is the largest membership organization that exists. And so having the involvement of Labour in crucial campaigns like this really makes a world of difference. It brings resources, it brings uh, people from all different backgrounds into uh, a position of saying we have a strong opinion and we want it to be heard and we want decisions to be made accordingly. If you're against the war, you have to be in support of these soldiers. I mean, there's no, there's no contradiction in, in, in that. Supported by many community organizations, Jeremy Hinsman was the first war resistor to have a hearing before the Immigration and Refugee Board. With lawyer Jeffrey House, Jeremy Hinsman made his case for refugee status. But the board would not allow arguments about the legality of the Iraq war. Jeremy must now appeal to a federal court. And the whole reason we came to Canada was to not be complicit in an illegal war. So our hands were completely tied before the thing even commenced. They chose to dismiss, uh, for example, all the evidence of violations of international humanitarian law. Um, what, th what the jurisprudence says is that where there's systematic violation of international humanitarian law, then you don't have to participate. In the American case, um, there, there are something like 10,000 Iraqis in custody right now. Uh, we're aware of 110 or so who have died in custody. There are ongoing investigations that suggest that approximately 30 of these people were tortured to death. 
And so if you're a soldier feeding that system, uh, it feels pretty systematic because it's not only Abu Ghraib, but uh, Camp Bukha, a number of other camps have seen torture deaths. That's one element. In Jeremy's case, uh, his organization, the 82nd Airborne, was involved in an incident in which uh, there was a peaceful demonstration. Supposedly, a bullet flew overhead, uh, and uh, they fired into the crowd and shot something like 20 people to death. And that's a pretty clear war crime. Well, what the board said was, oh, well, that's inevitable, that's um, collateral damage. And so it's dismissive. They, they looked at the evidence, but rather than treat it seriously, they dismiss it, oh, it's inevitable. And we're also demanding of the Canadian government that they make a, uh, a ruling that these young people be able to stay. There are a lot of precedents, whether it be the domestic worker program or in uh, you know, numbers of years back, uh, people from Eastern Europe were able to uh, come into this country. Uh, people from Southeast Asia after Vietnam were able to come into this country. And if they were here for two years and uh, you know, were productively a part of Canadian society, they were able to get landed immigrant status. So there are a number of different things that the government could do. And that's why we want to keep the pressure up to uh, to make sure they're allowed to stay. The only alternative we have is the hope of Canada. I mean, that's our only hope. Other than that, like if we had to go back to the United States after coming here, we would all receive, receive fierce and harsh punishment. Uh, very, very, very harsh punishment. If they had one of us back to show as an example, they would make it so severe for the cause that no other, they don't want no other soldiers to do it, so they'd make it where they went for the fact that's what would happen to them. Once again, I'll remind people of the words of uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau uh, back in the Vietnam period where he said Canada should be a refuge from militarism. Well, right now the United States is caught in a frenzy of militarism. I think Canadians are proud of their history in the Vietnam period of offering sanctuary, and I think they will be proud to uh, looking back on it if they do the same thing nowadays. You know, we strongly believe that we made the right choice coming to Canada. Here we have the freedom to tell our side of the story and the chance to live a normal life. And fortunately for us, we have the support we have here with the War Resisters Campaign, our lawyer, Jeffrey House. We have the support that we need. And when I look at my family and my heart, I know I made the right choice for no longer participating in the invasion of Iraq and for not putting my life in danger for the greed of one man. I'm sorry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote, quote George Galloway. The only thing that Iraq wants is to see the U.S. soldiers in the back of our heads getting on airplanes and getting out of there. Only that will Iraq be free. That, that's all I got to say. Just keep. I just want to stay in Canada, raise my son, raise my family here in a peace-loving country. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you all. The War Resisters Support Campaign is calling on the Canadian government to make a provision that would allow U.S. war resisters to stay in Canada. To find out how to lend your support, visit www.resisters.ca. No more waiting, time for us to say. Let them stay. Let them stay. U.S. soldiers stay. who preserved the U.S. military and have made their way to Toronto and they're looking for asylum here in Canada. They are the tip of the iceberg. There are already 25,000 Canadians who signed the national petition of the federal government in Ottawa demanding the Canada open our doors to any American who opposes the war in Iraq. Put your